Welcome and good evening, everyone. I'm Lonnie Friedman, the Health Literacy Specialist at Mackenzie Health Vaughan Library in the Cordellucci Vaughan Hospital. Tonight, we have three special guests from Boomerang Health, powered by Sick Kids. They are Carolyn Davidson, speech language pathologist, Vanessa Lombardo, occupational therapist, and Katie Sherkop, who is a physiotherapist. They will talk about school readiness milestones in preschoolers. Please place your comments in the chat and I will read them out loud anonymously at the end of the session for them to answer. This session will be recorded and appear on Vaughn Public Library's YouTube page in the near future. Before we begin, however, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. On behalf of Vaughn Public Libraries, I would like to respect respectfully acknowledge that our libraries were built upon the territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation per the Toronto Purchase Agreement or Treaty 13. We also recognize we are situated in the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee who occupied this land before the arrival of European settlers. The city of Vaughan is currently home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge their contributions to the life and prosperity of this land. With that, I am pleased to welcome Boomerang Health to do their presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this uh, Tuesday evening. Um, we're really excited to uh, share our knowledge with you all. Um, this presentation will focus on school readiness milestones in children aged three to five. Uh, so these are children who are entering either junior kindergarten or senior kindergarten. Uh, and we'll give you some of the speech, fine motor and gross motor milestones, as well as just some general tips about children who are entering school. Uh, so a little bit about us. Uh, my name is Kate Chirkoff. I am a registered physiotherapist. I have about 15 years experience treating uh, infants, children, adolescents in uh, both the private and public sector. Um, I work also in neurodevelopmental and orthopedic physiotherapy. And my name is Carolyn Davidson. I am a registered speech language pathologist and work with toddlers, children and adolescents in the areas of both receptive and expressive language, which is the comprehension and use of language, articulation or speech sound production, social communication, fluency um, or otherwise known as stuttering and also literacy skills. And I'm Vanessa Lombardo. I'm an occupational therapist and I work with um, babies, toddlers, kids, school age kids, adolescents, um, really many different ages in a number of areas such as fine motor, feeding, sensory processing, and self-regulation. So uh, a little bit about our clinic. So we work at a clinic called Boomerang Health, uh, which is located in Vaughan. It's located at Jane Rutherford, just uh, across the street from Canada's Wonderland. Uh, we have a full team of both physician specialists, such as uh, neurologists, gastroenterologists, pe uh, pediatricians, uh, many different uh, subspecialties in our physician department. Uh, we also have a full team of rehabilitation therapists. So we have occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech language pathologists, social work, psychology, dietitian, massage. I don't know if I'm forgetting anyone, but we do have a full team of rehab uh, therapists as well. Uh, we offer both assessments, therapy, groups, workshops, and uh, camps for uh, children aged 0 to 18. And our clinic is owned by the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Great, so our topic tonight will focus on, as Kate had said, milestones and uh, school readiness skills for kids age three to five. So those kiddos entering JK or SK. Um, when referring to school, this term will be used regardless of if your child, child is learning traditionally um, online, you know, homeschool, whatever that may look like. There's a number of different skills that are required across the board to be ready what we consider ready for school. Um, and we will not be discussing specifics of the provincial back to school plan or any health and safety policies related to back to school. So school readiness itself um, is a very exciting time for everyone. It can certainly be um, 
stressful. We don't know what's coming. It's exciting. Um, there's a large variability of skills based on chronological age, previous exposure or practice of the various skills before going to school. Um, and it encompasses a combination of practical and functional skills, social emotional skills. So it's really sort of the development of fundamental age appropriate skills required for learning and functioning at school. And today we'll be covering three areas of that, the fine motor, gross motor and speech and language. And so I will get started with um, some of the fine motor skills. So for ages three to four, entering JK, um, there's a number of fine motor skills that we are looking for to be developed or working on to be developed to be successful in a lot of the activities and requirements of JK. So hand dominance, um, we still might see, you know, they've certainly picked a hand and that's what they're using more times than not. There might be an occasional, but more times, like very often, they're going to have that hand that they're always going to, that they're using, that they're starting to practice refining or coloring, using utensils, all of those things. Um, and that mature pencil grasp is emerging. So when they're younger, they might be using their fists. Um, but by the time they are three to four entering JK, they should be starting to use what we call our tripod. So how, you know, you or I typically hold our pencil, um, and that's just going to become more refined as they enter JK. Um, by the ages of three to four, they're able to start imitating. Uh, imitating pre-printing shapes. So there are a number of shapes that are very important to be able to draw before we're able to learn our letters. So um, for up to about age four, it's horizontal, vertical lines, circles, um, and then a cross or a lowercase t sort of. So these are all really important um, because we need all of these lines and curves and shapes to be able to start practicing our letters when we get to school. Um, cutting along a straight line. So by between three and four, we're able to hold our scissors with what we call our thumbs up grasp, hold them and cut along the straight line using our helper hand to hold onto it, to, with the, um, to hold onto the piece of paper. Um, eating using a spoon and fork, again, um, with the preferred hands. Uh, unzipping zippers and buttons. Um, so by this age, we're able to undress ourselves. Uh, zippers and buttons are always more difficult and it's always gonna be easier to unzip or undo them first. So unzipping um, might need some help still because they can certainly get stuck, but definitely trying that and putting on socks and shoes. So also um, able to put on a number of articles of clothing as well, sometimes might need a little bit help um, and putting on those socks and shoes. So for ages four and five, entering senior kindergarten, the skills that I just mentioned become more refined. We practice them a little bit more, um, especially if we were in JK. And so now we're working on refining them. So we have that tripod grasp and we're going to now um, just be stronger, more fluid, easier to color and write, um, move our wrists, all of those sorts of things. We're able to imitate most, almost all basic shapes. So by four to five, we can do a square and we are on our way towards triangles. So um, what I like to say is that these shapes, you know, when we hit milestones, it doesn't just appear. We can certainly be working on them um, so that we're able to get it by whatever that um, developmental age they say. So um, we're not quite on full triangle, but working on those diagonal lines are really important as well. Um, we are able to print our name, likely all in capital letters, um, writes 10 to 19 letters a minute. So we are doing much more, much more writing. Coloring inside the line, so really concerned with staying inside the boundaries and draws distinguishable, distinguishable pictures. Um, and one that I like to do, you know, is having them draw themselves or family members and seeing between four and five, all those parts, arms, legs, heads, body, that all starts to come together and look like people. Um, they're using a spoon and a fork and they're able to use a knife and they engage um, a doing so that will be their dominant hand and then a helping hand spontaneously that's always going to come in and hold and or stabilize however they need. 
Okay, so for fine motor activities, um, these are some examples that we like to use in the clinic with our clients that um, we like to suggest for parents to continue at home, but there's a number of different ways that you can practice or make some of these activities easier for school readiness. So using a variety of writing tools and engaging in multi-sensory activities. So um, when we're learning writing, whether it's shapes, whether it's letters, um, whatever it may be, using multi-sensory, we call it so different, engaging different senses can be a really great way to practice. So you'll see on the slide, some of the pictures we have chalk, that's a great one because it offers a lot of resistance. Um, shaving cream, that's another great one. Little pieces of rice or little like plastic glitter rocks that you can put in a pan to make letters. Um, so anything where we're practicing using different means. It doesn't have to be pencil paper, or crayon paper. Um, really great for the brain and muscles to learn those skills. You can hide small items like pom-poms or beads to promote hand separation. So what that means is when we think about how we hold our pencil with our tripod, tri meaning three, it's our first three fingers. You can hide a pom-pom or something in our other two, in our ring and our pinky, and then that's going to help them separate the sides of the hand, we call it, so that they're able to practice um, holding with that tripod grasp. Using Play-Doh to practice cutting with scissors and knives. So um, as young as two, using the scissors that are plastic, um, they don't have the actual blade on them, and you can you know, pull about some Play-Doh, roll it out, and have them cut that. That's a great way to practice it um, with scissors and knives. Completing various crafts. Crafts are always getting our, our hands and our senses involved, so those are always great to practice our fine motor skills. Storing home items in containers, so a lot of times when kids might not always be spontaneously using their other hand, I will recommend parents put stuff in various Tupperware or Ziploc bags so that they have to really learn and practice using that other hand to stabilize something so that they're able to pull apart or pull a lid off. Um, building up zippers with stickers, so sometimes it can be hard to also grasp those little zippers, so adding a little charm or a sticker off the edge, making um, it just a larger area to grasp, and then practicing routines as well, so having a bathroom routine, a dressing routine, a nighttime routine, meal times, um, following routines is, you know, something they do at school as well, so practicing that at home is helpful. And fine motor red flag. So he, these are some things that um, might be red flag that we aren't quite meeting some of those milestones for school readiness or just having a little bit um, more challenge working on these skills and reaching them. So hands seem weak. Um, you know, if we're going to pick something up, it's uh, we might drop it. Dropping small things like beads, pom-poms often signify that um, our hands are a little bit weaker or if we're using our, you know, whole fist or our palm rather than our fingertips to do something that our fingertips usually do, um, often tells us that our tips are a little bit weaker. Um, same with finger hand movements being shaky, hypermobile joints, unable to hold on to writing tool security. Uh, securely. So a lot of times if we have that weakness or shakiness or difficulty, it's going to be tricky to do things like holding our writing tools, um, trouble imitating our figures and shapes, challenges with self-care tasks like dressing, um, difficulty with feeding by ourselves. A lot of um, clients prefer to use their hands rather than a spoon or a fork if they have trouble with fine motor skills and cannot play with uh, toys functionally. So um, we might see, you know, they prefer to line cars up instead of having the brakes and things of that nature. Hi, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the gross motor milestones. So gross motor implies using the large muscle groups. So um, legs, trunk, uh, walking, running, jumping, those kinds of things. Uh, and it is interesting and something I wanted to point out, not just for kind of my section, but for all of our sections that 
yeah, it's a very wide range of normal that you will see um, with any kids, but especially when you look at like a junior kindergarten classroom, there are children who will be three until the end of December. Uh, and there will be kids in the same class that are had turned four in January. So that's actually almost a full calendar year difference. Um, so it's not surprising that you will see different levels of physical and gross motor and fine motor and speech. So just something to keep in mind for children entering JK. As well, something else to note is that most public schools in Ontario are a JK SK split. So not only are some children three until the end of December, some of these kids are five already. So there can be quite a large uh, variation in what you see in any given classroom. Um, but that being said, some of the things you uh, may notice for a child entering junior kindergarten, um, a three-year-old three generally can walk up and down the stairs independently. Uh, they usually would require upper extremity support. So a hand support on a railing or an adult's hand in order to go up the stairs. And they generally go with what we would call a step two pattern. So we go right, left, right, left, right, left. Uh, by age four, generally they can go with one foot on each step when they're going up the stairs. For both of these age groups, when they're going down, they generally use what we call a step two pattern, which means step together, step together. And they may or may not require support of holding onto a railing. A child entering junior kindergarten should be able to jump easily with two feet, which means they should bend their knees and push off uh, evenly with both feet and be able to clear the ground or a small object. Um, they should be able to throw a ball at a target with some accuracy. Um, we're not talking like a very small target, but more like you're throwing a ball to a family member or in a general area. Um, they can kick a ball, which also kind of ties into the next point is that they can stand on one foot for five seconds. So they should be able to balance on both legs fairly evenly within a second or two. Uh, but unable to kick a ball, you need to be able to stand on one foot. So those are very closely linked. And generally, a child entering JK should be able to walk forwards, backwards, sideways, switch direction. They should be able to navigate their environment in a way where they're not clumsy, tripping, falling, and they should be able to get around pretty well. So again, now when we're looking for the children who are entering SK, very similar to the fine motor skills, you expect that the current gross motor skills that you have have gotten a little bit better or a little bit cleaner. So at this age, a mature running pattern starts to emerge. So Kids entering JK may have more of a waddly kind of run. Their arms might be pumping funny to the side. It's very normal for younger kids to have more uh, of an immature running pattern. When they start to turn four or five, a mature uh, running pattern starts. So that means the arms are starting to pump. They're starting to lift their legs a little bit higher when they're running and starting to look more adult than child. But again, this will still take a few more years to refine, but this is when it starts to change. Um, at this age, they begin to be able to jump on instead of two feet, but on one foot, two to three times in a row. They can easily kind of hop and jump and skip over objects. Uh, the difference between hopping is actually jumping up and down on one foot and skipping is going from foot to foot. And at this age, they should be able to do both. As well as the stairs, they can do a reciprocal, so step through pattern on the way up and either a step to or a reciprocal on the way down. Something else that starts to change at this age that instead of catching a ball, which is trapping, which means it hits their chest and they squash it against it, they're starting to be able to catch a ball in their hands. So um, parents often ask me in my practice, um, you know, what kind of things can we do at home? Uh, the first thing is to practice stair climbing at home. So as parents, sometimes we tend to be very close to our children on the stairs or hold their hands or, you know, help assist them. In school, unfortunately, uh, there's only one teacher or two teachers for a larger amount of kids, so they can't provide that physical support. So getting your kids confident going up and down stairs, often um, kindergarten classrooms are on the main floor. But sometimes they might have reading buddies upstairs or they might have library upstairs. So uh, it's not unheard of that some children will encounter uh, stairs kind of on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, allow your children as much independence as they can at parks. So similar kind of to the first one, we oftentimes like to be very close. We don't want our kids to fall and get hurt. 
Uh, risky play is very important. So allowing your children to explore their environment safely um, gives them confidence to know, maybe I shouldn't go that high, or this is what I can handle. And this is how our children learn to be independent players. Exploring nature is huge. Um, going to different trails, um, you know, walking in sand, walking in, um, on gravel, walking on uneven ground, all of those are really good for strengthening. Um, another one I love is creating an obstacle course at home with chalk. So you can do like something on your driveway where you try to like jump over the line or walk on the line, hopscotch, things like that. Um, allow your children time for unstructured outdoor play. So allow them to explore the environment without giving them a toy or something to do and allow them to be a little bit bored in order to kind of learn how to, you know, uh, work through different things in the environment and entertain themselves and practice physical activity every day as a family, going for walks, bike rides, uh, going to different parks, going to splash pads and enjoying that time together. So some red flags uh, that are noted for gross motor skills. So persistent toe walking. So that's children who walk on the balls of their feet for a significant amount of time past kind of that learning to walk stage. When children are learning to walk, it's not uncommon that they would go up on the balls of their feet. Uh, but if this continues past age three or so, then it's generally good to get it checked out. If they can't go up and down stairs independently at the age of three, if they can't jump uh, and clear the ground by age three, or if your child seems very clumsy or clumsier than other children of their age, they seem to fall, they seem to hurt themselves more often. Um, they generally seem to be struggling navigating their environment. Um, that kind of li uh, links into frequent falls. Uh, if you think that your child may not be keeping up with children of the same age, for example, if they're on a soccer team, it seems like they get really out of breath or they're not able to do similar things to other kids their own age, sometimes it's good to get checked out. Uh, this is the next one is kind of true of all of our disciplines. If a child has mastered a skill, let's say jumping, and then it seems like they can't anymore. Same with speech. If they've had a word or they're speaking and then they can't do it anymore. Um, that's always a fairly large red flag and should be brought up to their pediatrician right away. Um, worsening of balance over time or that your child complains of persistent uh, pain in their legs and their arms and their trunk or persistent fatigue. Okay, great. So now we're going to be moving on to communication milestones. And I just want to provide a couple of really brief definitions so that we're all on the same page about what we're speaking about. So receptive language looks at the comprehension of language, whether it's oral language, something that's spoken to your child or written language. Expressive language is the ability to use language again, whether orally or written. And for these kids, it's most of the time oral language. Articulation looks at their speech sound production. Social communication gets into their interaction skills with their peers and those around them. And literacy, we're gonna be talking about early reading um, and writing skills. Not writing from the actual production of writing, that would get into fine motor, but more the content of their writing and their ideas. So for a child age three to four who's entering junior kindergarten, from a comprehension standpoint, they should be able to understand a variety of WH questions. So what, where, when, um, why, how. They should be able to also follow multi-step instructions that are either related or unrelated. So a related multi-step instruction might be, go get your water, put it on the table, and then meet me at the front door. All of those are kind of um, in line with each other in one sort of sequence. An unrelated multi-step instruction would be clap your hands, jump up and down, and tap your toes. So one has nothing to do with the other one, and they should be able to easily follow multi-step novel instructions that they haven't heard before. When we look at a child's expressive language or their use of language, they should be able to now create long sentences. So sentences as long as five or more words. Um, they are not always using five or more words because sometimes it's completely appropriate to just say, no thanks, and that can be an entire sentence in and of itself, but they can use a long sentence should it be needed. They're also using the majority of their grammatical structures. So their speech is starting to sound, or their language, I should say, is starting to sound more and more adult-like. 
Um, of course, as Kate mentioned in her portion, there's a big difference between the December babies and the January babies. So you're going to see more grammatical errors if your child is born later in the year. Um, and the grammatical structures that develop the latest are the irregular ones. So irregular past tense, irregular plurals, but all of the regular forms should be pretty well developed. And we should see that they're able to tell simple stories. Typically, the stories may form um, in what's called more of a leapfrog narrative. So we connect one point to the next by and then, and then. So I went to school, and then I had recess, and then I had lunch. And there's not a lot of other um, sequencing language in there, but they should be able to have beginning, middles, and ends. When we look at their articulation or their speech sound production, an unfamiliar person should be able to understand what they're saying 75 to 90% of the time. So it's important to think about an unfamiliar person because you as their parent or caregiver is likely able to understand them significantly more than an unfamiliar person. So I always suggest, um, and now that we've been able to get back to seeing friends and family a little bit more, if you're at a play date with somebody or you're at the park and meeting somebody new, are you having to act as your child's translator because people don't understand them? Are you having to you know, repeat what you think they said or are they having to repeat themselves multiple times and act things out or show things? Um, if so, that's showing a sign that others aren't understanding them. There are a number of sounds that are still developing. I'm not going to go too much into detail on those because it really is quite age dependent. So we usually just talk about sort of that overall speech clarity. From the social skills perspective or the social communication, they should have complex imaginative play by age three to four. So their, their dolls, their figurines, their toys that they're playing with are following really complex sequences. You know, they're planning a birthday party and they're sending off the dad to go buy the cake and then the rest of the kids are arriving and they're acting all of this out. Um, and they should be able to take turns with friends. They still might not be great with sharing, but they are able to have a reciprocal back and forth during play. When we look at their literacy skills, they'll have an interest in rhyming and they're aware of the function of print. So they understand that when they go to a restaurant, the menu has words on it and those words mean something. Or when they see a stop sign, they recognize that there are letters on there. They're not yet maybe aware of what all the letters are or what their sounds are, but they're aware that those are letters and those letters serve a purpose. When we get into kids age four to five, so kids who are entering senior kindergarten, um, they can now understand a group instruction that has an if then. So, you know, a teacher might say to them, um, you know, wanting them to line up at recess, but not wanting everybody to get ready all at once, say, okay, if you're wearing blue, then go put your jacket on and line up at the door. If you've got a ponytail, go put on your jacket and line up at the door. And so it's not directed just to them, but they can figure out those different different criteria and know when it's their turn to follow the instruction. When we look at the expressive language, by this point, they've developed pretty much adult-like grammar, and they're able to describe past, present, and future events in great detail. They still may not have a great sense of exactly how far in the past or how far in the future something is. So, you know, they might say last week, but it really was a year ago, but they can remember and recall events or, or talk about an event that has yet to take place. When we look at their articulation or speech sound production, by this point, their speech is clear over 90% of the time. And the only sounds that may still be um, in error that are okay are the R sound, the TH, and maybe some distortions with their S sound. The rest of the sounds should be very solidly developed by the time they're entering senior kindergarten. When we look at their social communication skills, they really want to please their friends. They want to be able to have fun and, and they're seeking that um, approval and those relationships much more than in junior kindergarten. And they'll have more independence with their peers so they can come up with what they want to play and negotiate and problem solve that. By the time they're in SK, they should know all of the letters of the alphabet. They should be able to identify all of the sounds that those letters make, and they should also be able to identify the beginning sounds of words. So if you said, hey, what sound does the word cat start with? They should be able to tell you K sound. Um, depending on your school and the school's program and how reading is being introduced, 
They also likely by entering senior kindergarten might know some sight words um, and have learned those, but reading really is dependent on how the instruction has been targeted. So that's quite dependent on your um, type of learning. So when we're looking at general activities that support communication development, books are a fantastic one. And depending on what you're trying to achieve with the book, you can either choose board books with simpler texts or story books with longer text. So if your child has lots of language but hasn't yet developed how to sequence and tell you an event, you might want to choose a longer story where they can see sort of a beginning, middle, and end. Um, if you're working with your child on producing, you know, some of their sounds or they're still starting to use some simple phrases and they're not using longer sentences yet, you might want to use some simpler board box with a, a shorter text. Um, I really love to have um, kids look at and talk about family pictures. So now we've all got our phones with hundreds or thousands of pictures on it that display past events that we can be talking about. We can be modeling uh, vocabulary, grammar. Um, we can be talking about things from the past and then, you know, making predictions about future events. Um, structured and unstructured games are really important to help with social communication and play skills. So when we're with our peers, sometimes our teachers will give us really structured exercises or activities to do. And other side, times it's recess and free play and our kids need to learn how to navigate both of those, how to negotiate and problem solve, what to decide to play with and, and how to decide who goes first in the game. Um, guessing games are really great for learning to make inferences and following instructions and a following the leader or Simon says type game is really wonderful for in, um, again learning how to follow directions and these are always games that we can um, make more challenging for our kids as they get older so we can give them two or three parts to do on each Simon says um, versus just giving them one part. When we look at some red flags for communication development, as Kate said, if we've lost any of our previous skills, that is a really big red flag. So if your child used to be able to produce a sound or used to be talking in full sentences, and now they're not consistently, that is something we would want to be bringing up with our child's pediatrician and potentially seeking an evaluation for. Um, if your little one is not yet understanding instructions or questions by the words alone, and you're finding you need to be using other means, whether it's gestures um, or added facial expressions or emphasis on your words. So if you're saying, hey, come here and, you know, have a seat on this chair, and they understand it when you add the gestures, but not so much when you use the words alone, that becomes a concern. If you find that your child is not using full sentences or missing a significant amount of grammatical markers, so, you know, their parent comes home and they want to tell them that they went for ice cream today and they say, me go ice cream, that would not be a, a sentence type that we would be expecting to see in a school age child entering JK or SK. Um, if their speech is unclear to unfamiliar people, neighbor, neighbor, family members, friends, again, not people who live with them on a day to day basis. If we're looking at their social interaction skills and we're seeing poor engagement, so um, their eye contact is poor, they're having significant difficulty with turn taking, they're not yet demonstrating any pretend play skills, or they're just playing with the toys very concretely but not able to imagine with them. Um, and if they have a really big lack of interest in letters or sounds, um, those are all sort of reasons to either discuss it with your child's teacher or seek out an evaluation. Uh, so Carolyn, there were a few questions here. Did you want me to read them out or did you want to wait till the end? Uh, maybe we can wait till the end and then do them all at once. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. So the last kind of brief thing that I did want to chat about, and a lot of people ask me this is how do you pick a backpack or what are you looking for when you're looking to purchase a backpack for your child? Uh, as a parent myself of two school age children, my advice to you is you can buy one good backpack and it lasts two or three years, or you can buy like two to three backpacks a year that will constantly break. So they're very, very hard on their backpacks, especially the little ones will whip them around, drop them on the bus. So definitely look for a quality backpack and how you kind of do that is First, you wanna make sure they have nice wide straps. If the straps are too narrow, then the weight of the bag will pull down on their shoulders and some kids will find that uncomfortable. You wanna tighten the, the straps of the backpack by pulling down on them. So the bag sits just below your child's waist. If the bag is hitting your child in the back of the knees, it's too big. 
um, or if it's even going below kind of the buttocks area, then that is too large for your child. You want to pack heavier items in the bottom of the bag. So maybe your child's shoes or their lunchbox. Uh, and then maybe put some of the lighter things like their hat or mitts or snow pants in the top. Another excellent just kind of parent tip is always get a bag that has um, a water bottle holder on the outside because your kids will throw their water bottles into their bags upside down and then everything will be wet. So having it in its own little holder on the outside, one makes it easier for your child uh, to find their water bottle. Um, it's healthier, you know, for your child to be drinking through the day as a reminder, but also it means that most of your stuff's not coming home soaking wet, which you will definitely appreciate. Um, and they also suggest that you don't pack the bag heavier than 10 to 15% of your child's body weight. So a small child who's about 40 pounds, that means no more than six pounds. So if it doesn't need to be in the bag, don't put it in the bag. So lunchbox, agenda, and then hopefully running shoes, other things are left at school. Uh, so the next kind of little bit of tips is uh, ensure them to wear both straps and not just kind of hang off one shoulder. If there is a chest clip, ensure that it's done over the chest area and practice clipping it and unclipping it. Because if you strap them into their backpack and they can't unclip it, then they have to ask for help when they get to school. Uh, practice having them take their bag off and on independently and also have them practice putting things in and out themselves. So maybe you know, that you have two zippered components and your lunch fits better in the big one and your mitts are better in the small one. So practice where you're gonna put things. In the winter, it becomes astronomically harder to wear a backpack over a snowsuit, but that's unfortunately the nature of the beast living where we do. Um, don't choose a backpack that is too large or larger than your child's back. And ideally, kind of like I said before, it should rest from the top of their shoulders just to below their child's natural waist. Okay, so that was all of the um, structured content that we wanted to cover. So I know that there are some questions, so we can go through those now and you can feel free to add more into the chat and we're happy to stay and answer any questions that you have. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll read out the first one. Uh, one person asked, how would you recommend improving social maturity? Example, interacting and playing with other kids in a group environment for four-year-olds. So they gave the example that their child will hold on strongly and not be able to be left alone, even just for a couple meters with familiar children at a playground. Yeah, so that's a really great question. Uh, so the first thing would be that part that you already mentioned is starting with familiar people. Um, and I would even start just with people in your immediate family. So maybe if it is a two parent household or if there are siblings, um, you know, setting up an activity at the park where they have to, you know, go and kick a ball to their sibling that's away from the parent. So with trusted people, it's kind of getting them to move away from their parent and just gain some of that independence. And then you can start to branch from there where you might want to schedule sort of a play date time where you meet up at the park with people that you know. Um, you always kind of want to set the expectation up for your child so that they know who they're going to be seeing, they know where you're going to be standing, um, and then you can pull back support. So we always advocate for having the supports and scaffolding those, and then you can pull those away as you um, are able to. Um, something else is if it's somebody that you're meeting at the park, maybe you can plan to meet them before you get to the park because the park is a really, um, you know, we look at it like this really fun place. But if you think of it from your child's eyes, especially somebody who might be struggling with some of those social interaction skills, it is a very large, open, unstructured area where the boundaries of where they're allowed to go may be unclear, what they're allowed to go on. So having as little be new as possible once you get to the park is great. So if your friends want to meet you at one at a house and you walk to, you know, together to the park, then those are already familiar people once you've gotten there. So those are all little things that you can be doing um, and setting really small expectations at first. So maybe I'm going to be at the bottom of the slide and then we step kind of further and further away as we go. Great. Perfect. Um, our next question is, would you recommend SLP assessment if my child missed one or two of the communication milestones? So without knowing too many details on which milestones and the exact age of your child, um, I would always say you could start by discussing it with your child's pediatrician. Um, 
I will caution that a little bit because some pediatricians will take a wait and see approach beyond the point when myself as an SLP might take it. And this is the same for all of us. So I'm always a big proponent of, you know, an assessment never hurts. You might as well get an assessment done or get yourself on a list for assessment because some of the government funded programs have quite long wait lists. If after the assessment, they're deemed to be doing okay, you've got that information and nothing further is needed. Um, and for me, it also depends on which areas. So so if their receptive language or comprehension is doing amazing and their talking is okay, but maybe their grammar is just a little bit off, I might have a little bit more patience to wait for that. But if the concerns are really around the comprehension or the social interaction, I have less comfort waiting with those areas because those can lead to um, bigger challenges once we enter school. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, before I read the last question that's posted, for anyone who is wants to say something, now is the time. Please enter it in the chat, and I'll read it after this question. Uh, so this is a little longer. It's for some context. I sometimes feel that schools are asking a lot from three to four-year-olds in full-day settings, that we are pushing them a bit too fast for their age. My son is entering JK and will be four in November. For example, there is no way he will be putting on shoes, socks by September on his own. How does, how does staff facilitate when certain fine gross motor skills are lacking? I can, I can take that one and maybe you know, if you want to chime in kind of as well. Um, schools are used to dealing with children who are kind of some who are younger, we would say a younger three and kind of an older four. Uh, the other great thing that you might notice about JKSK splits is that most kids in kindergarten or junior kindergarten can't zip up their coats. They don't necessarily, or they can't do it yet. And that, like I was always, as a parent, very concerned that my kid be with their, their coat undone. So often what will happen is sometime between, you know, JK and SK, um, what they'll do is the older kids might be a helper. So if they see that half the kids are zipped up in their coats and half aren't, they'll say, can anyone help their friend with their coat? And then sometimes the older kids will help facilitate with the younger one. Um, as far as socks go, that is very challenging for a lot of kids who are in the JK age. Uh, but hopefully, if you put the socks on in the morning, the hope is that they stay on for the full day. They may or they may not. Uh, but shoes, um, and I'm sure Vanessa can speak a little bit to this as well, making sure that they have Velcro and not laces, uh, and practice, practice, practice. And if they can't do it, somebody will help them, either the teacher, the ECE, and sometimes an older friend. And you will be shocked sometimes at the amount of growth that you'll see in these young threes from September, even till December. Sometimes they can do things that you never thought they were because they, they're they in this class of kids and they rise to the occasion. Even though it's a lot of anxiety as a parent to kind of put them there, they generally do quite well and the teachers are used to kids who are younger as well great thanks for the context okay we got a couple more questions this is awesome let me read out the next one my son just got diagnosed for asd is there any recommendation of place where we can lead we can have play dates and meet people in a more structured place not playgrounds he has a speech delay yeah, great question. So I think um, depending on, I'm assuming that you do live in York region since you're attending this talk there, if, if you haven't already been linked up with the Children's Treatment Network of Simcoe York or having an early interventionist, I would certainly look into those organizations um, and they can facilitate um, different services and provide you with recommendations of different places. Um, there's also the Ontario Earlier Centers, which I believe are now called Early On. Um, and so those are um, free facilities where you can go and there's different activities like circle time and, and different things. Some of them are drop in and some of them you have to sign up in advance to register. And so there's smaller numbers of people in controlled sort of spaces. And so it's not as unstructured. Um, but certainly in this situation, especially if there's also a speech or language delay, you might have to stay a little bit closer initially to help facilitate. 
Um, and then the other option is looking into some private services. So whether, you know, I, not, not that I'm pushing services at Boomerang Health, but whether there's different organizations that are running, you know, social skills programs or different types of group programs specifically for kids your child's age at your child's level who they can um, interact with. Yes, and let me add something to that. I have a shameless plug for the library. We have lots oh, yeah. of ASD resources here. Uh, it's specifically at the new VMC. There we go. At the new VMC library, uh, we have specific area for people, uh, for kids with like bubble machines. And we have kits at different branches that you can borrow, specifically tailored for children with ASD. So please visit your library as well. Okay, next question. How about a four-year-old who is great in all things you mentioned, but the issue is English is not his first language. He kind of gets scared by the thought of going to school since he will have children speaking a different language. Any tips? Yeah, so I mean, this is something that Kate mentioned before about sort of the gross motor or fine motor if your child is younger. Um, the teachers are really well equipped to help navigate a child who English is not their first language. And what we know about language development is um, for a child who has a very strong base in their home language with no delays, they will be able to pick up a second, third, and multiple languages um, to the same degree if those languages are exposed before the age of five or six. So mm -hmm. um, they, they might have a little bit of a rocky start, in all honesty, if it's hard for them. But um, once they start to learn the routines, you'll be amazed how quickly they're picking up. So if their comprehension is good, they might not understand verbally everything their teacher is saying, but if they see everybody lining up at the door or getting their lunch boxes, they'll be able to pick up the routines. And the schools are very well prepared. There are lots of kids who are starting to school with not a lot of English exposure because they've been at home this whole time being exposed to their home language. Um, and, and you'll see some pretty rapid development of English language in those first few months. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, there, our next question, will the teacher help kids for their bathroom time, especially put his pants back on? Thanks. Uh, so my understanding is they will not. Um, I don't believe teachers are allowed to physically help children with dressing or undressing. And so that's one that you really want to make sure that you are practicing at home, helping them do things completely by themselves in this last sort of a month before school starts, getting them to practice taking their pants off, pulling them back on and thinking about, um, you know, Vanessa, I don't know if you have any tips for the kinds of pants, but definitely not like jeans with buttons and zippers and things like the kinds of pants um, or clothing that they can be wearing. Wearing. You want to? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I can chime in for sure. Um, one of the things I like to recommend when we're practicing uh, dressing, especially, is what we call backward chaining. So, um, if you think of the act, you know, of undressing and, and pulling up our pants, so we can think of it in a bunch of different sequences. And what you want to do as the parent is complete every single step except for the last one. So, um, let's say we get habits on like through our put our legs through the holes um and then you have them just pull it up or if that's difficult have uh pull it up till about their bum and have them then practice over our bum because it's uh, over the bum is often a lot trickier that's sort of where kids can get stuck um and then once they've mastered that you're gonna scale back the next step so okay now it's pulling up the whole length of the leg and the bum so really really practicing that one step until we have mastered it and then doing that with each of the next steps so that we're able to build up that whole skill. Um, and then, yeah, again, in terms of pants, things that are looser are usually um, easier um, considering things, you know, if they have sort of a tight seam at the base, then it's going to be harder to get my foot in there. So things that are a little bit wider as well. And then yeah, nothing with, you know, buttons or any sort of things, just an elastic that you can pull up. Um, if the elastic's really tight, you'll have to again, consider stretching and pulling it over my bum. So if it's a little bit looser, but we'll still hold up, that's going to be your best bet. Mm -hmm. And a good tip too, is don't buy the sweatpants that are slightly too big that have to be tied in a knot at the top because it, sometimes it turns into a double knot and then they can't get them off. And then sometimes they have to retie them or they're falling off. And then they kind of spend the whole day holding up their pants. So for this first couple of months, make sure they have pants that they can take off, but also they're not too tight or too loose. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Okay, this is our last question. Uh, piggybacking on the potty stuff, what are the bum wiping expectations? Lots of my friends with slightly older kids say they come home with dirty bums and the wiping skill doesn't develop for a while. We're still working on it here, but it's much to be desired. Any tips? Mm -hmm. So legal so, teachers are not allowed to aid with toileting. Um, mm -hmm. So they need to be as independent as they can be. And it is sometimes a messy few months while they are learning that. Uh, but yeah, Vanessa, you can probably talk a little bit more about the toileting part. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of things that I like to recommend and also work on um, with kids in the clinic. So having some sort of social story or book that really outlines each of those steps can be really helpful to, if you're, you know, first introducing with younger kids. Um, once we are sort of getting into it and practicing, there's a couple methods. So um, one of the things is fold and wipe. So you get a couple pieces, um, you do that initial wipe, and then you look. Um, if it's dirty, you fold, you do it again, look. If it's still dirty, fold, do it again. So that's to actually tell once you're finally clean. Um, in terms of working on that skill to get your arm all the way back there, it's definitely tricky. Um, I would have them sit on you know, a stool or something similar to the size um, from the ground of a toilet and model and then have them practice and just keep practicing leaning forwards, reaching over um, and doing that over and over. If you know it's easier to sort of have them stand and lean over, whatever works to help keep them supported. Um, it's, it's again, really about practicing that skill and then also the actual action of wiping. So, um, if there's any difficulty with that, I like to first introduce and practice wiping, you know, peanut butter on a plate or on our arm or something, um, even just to get the right amount of force and then you kind of put all those pieces together, um, and practice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the library too has lots of resources, uh, books and videos you can borrow for some tips there. Uh, we got lots of thank yous for answering the questions and the general presentation. It's such a relief for some of your answers. We have one last quick comment. Uh, if the teacher can't touch them though, this is after like an accident, who helps or cleans up the accidents? So, oh. when... oh, go ahead, Kate. So when they're in junior or senior kindergarten, there's generally an ECE in the classroom as well. Um, so if there's an accident on the floor, they're not expecting the child to, to clean that up themselves. Uh, the ECE is allowed to verbally talk them through cleaning themselves, but they are not allowed to physically help them. So if it is quite a significant mess, um, sometimes parents will be called but that happens very, very rarely. Generally, you will send your child to school with um, a couple changes of clothes that would stay there because accidents do happen. Even children, as an aside, even children that are very potty trained get really excited in kindergarten. There are lots of accidents. It's nothing to be ashamed about, both kind of from a parenting perspective, but also as a child's perspective, because the, it, it's it's new environment for these children and the kindergarten teachers have seen everything <laughs> like there, there's no mess there's nothing that is going to shock them per se they, they this is what they do and they've seen lots of kids come in and accidents are very 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 common even from kids who may have been toilet trained for almost two and a half years by the time they get there and, and just to add to that um especially if your child potentially does have some challenges with their comprehension, um, because they're only allowed to sort of verbally coach them through it. These are instructions you want to be working on with them at home. So, you know, um, you don't want the teacher or the EC providing them with instructions like, you know, take your underwear, put one foot in, put the other, and they're not understanding. I mean, they certainly will try to add some gestures to help them, but these are things to be practicing now at home. So even, I mean, we're not going to make our kid have an accident or make there be a mess of course but we can just say hey we're going to change our clothes now isn't that so silly even though we're all clean okay let's take our pants off how do we do it and walking them through if they're able to physically do it on their own great if not as Vanessa said having them do the last part and building up what they can do um but then from there also having them know like my spare clothes are in this big ziplock can I open the ziplock can I go in do I know what I have to take and work through all of those so if it does happen they understand the instructions and they practice kind of all of those steps in the comfort of your own home and the safety of home as well. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and most, most kindergartens do actually have a bathroom in the in the room um, and they have a yeah. child sized toilet and a stool sometimes so majority i believe if not all will have a, a bathroom right in the room so that if a child needs to go they don't have to run down the hallway it's it's usually in the classroom itself that's great thanks for the answer um oh yeah someone asked about the uh, small size in the classroom they are indeed yeah. for children yeah yep. okay with that i think we'll call it a night everyone thanks again to Carolyn, Kate, and Vanessa for joining us today. If you enjoyed this, thanks again for um, joining. Uh, this will be posted on YouTube in the next couple of weeks, the archive, so feel free to send it to your friends once it is. If you wanna contact uh, any of our speakers, you can reply to the email that I sent you with the Zoom link, and I will uh, put you in contact with them. So thanks again. Uh, Carolyn, Kate, and Vanessa, and I hope everyone enjoyed this session and we'll see you soon. Have a good night. Nothing. Good night. <laughs>